Hi, everyone, and welcome to my podcast. My name is Gabriela Handel, and this podcast is called The Conversation About Art. Today, I bring you episode 94, and I will be talking with artist Brian Haberlin. Um, if you would like to support this podcast, you can like, share the video, and subscribe. And all other methods of subscribing, of uh, supporting, will be in the show notes, description, caption. So, well, Brian, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for your time. Um, your sure, episode. Yeah, your episode, of course, your episode 94. Um, please tell our listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. I'm Brian Haberlin, uh, and I've been a professional artist since I was 18, which is a long time ago now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm mostly known for, uh, I started as an illustrator and then got into comics in 1993. Uh, and, and I've been, most of my career since then has been in comics. Uh, I co-created Witchblade, I ran Top Cow Productions, mm -hmm. which one of the Image Comics lines. I uh, had my own studio, Will's Potassio, where we did Stone and several other titles. I also had my other company uh, work for Marvel. We worked on, I've worked on almost every single comic book that there could be in the day. Um, was editor-in-chief of Todd McFarlane Productions, drew Spawn for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and then started my company, Anomaly Productions, in uh, 2010, uh, where we did big, epic uh, graphic novels uh, with augmented reality. So we were pioneers in augmented reality back then, um, and uh, and have come up with multiple of my own characters, so Anomaly, Hellcop, Shifter, Creative Preacher Catcher is our children's book. Um, uh, the Last Barbarians was my most, my most recent book, but uh, every year I come out with a couple new titles that I create and write and draw or co-write and, and co-draw or whatever, but my hands are are in all those things. And now this year, really, I'm trying to push my, my more of my fine art career and had my first gallery show in Soho uh, this year and other shows that seem to be lined up for next year, so. Wow, that's all right. That's it. That's amazing. Witchblade and Spawn. That's awesome. And Marvel, yeah. and and Soho, yeah. New York. Yeah. You're in. You're located in New York. No, 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 no. That's where the group. That's where my group show was. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. At so Ar at the Arcadia Gallery in New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So so after being all of this the this whole time in comics, you're you're trying to like build uh, a fine art career. How come? Yeah, I always figured that'd be my retirement plan. Okay. <laughs> okay, but uh, but why not stick with the the comics since you have like all that uh, kind of traction or experience or you mean reputation, you know? Well, I mean, I that will always happen too. I think. Um, uh, it's just you know sometimes it's just it sometimes it's. It, it's more fun to just turn off the brain and just do the art mm -hmm. rather than having to write a full story that makes sense and, okay. and deal. I mean, uh, uh, comics is hard. I mean, comics is 20 plus pages of art plus two to three covers a month uh, okay. or more. Um, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, I do have a passion for it. Um, but uh, right now, kind of exploring the, the other side. I mean, because I have three new comics I'll be working on this next year. So mm -hmm. it's not like I'm not going to be doing comics right. too, you know. Um, but they're, they're, they're different hats and they're different itches to scratch. You know, <laughs> yeah. so I also do the writing stuff. It looks like I'm, uh, I'm going to be co-writing an adaptation of one of my uh, graphic novels, Houdini, The Man from Beyond, I did many years ago with uh, the Academy Award winner of The Green Book. He, he, he wrote The Green Book and produced The Green Book, so we're going to be doing the screenplay together. Mm -hmm. And then I also am a producer. We have several projects for television and feature film. So, you know, I run Anomaly Productions. It's my company, so it's more, it's, I have employees and the whole nine yards and stuff, so. Damn. So wear many hats. Yeah, you wear like all the hats, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Too many sometimes, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's cool. I mean, is there? I mean, is there anything that you're? All right, give me a second because I want to ask something, but I'm not sure how to ask it. I mean, because you're doing so much stuff, how do you feel? I don't know, confident doing all of it, I guess. 
I'm old and I've been doing it long enough to know that I'm not terrible at it. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yes, but but at the same time, it's like I've been doing it for such a long time, you know. So yeah, okay. So then, so then, when you're talking about writing the um, the screenplay, I mean, is that yeah. similar to writing a comic story? Very much. I mean, that's my my my. I have a master's degree in communication arts. Screenwriting was my emphasis. Back ah, yeah. Okay, I, okay, okay. Oh, so you have a whole last title at that. I, okay. And then when I first started, my first job out of out of film school was Laura Mar Television, where I worked in comedy and drama series development, mm -hmm. and then worked on current programs, worked on like Lois and Clark, Family Matters, Perfect Strangers, tons of shows, and then went into comics. Uh-huh. Okay. So, all right. So you used the expression of, you know, itching, I mean, scratching an itch, and, you know, you're obviously still scratching the itch of comics because you're still doing it. Um, but... But, you know, what do you think, what kind of, what kind of stuff do you want to talk about when you talk, when you make a comic versus when you, I mean, do you make fine art now? Do you make just, just paintings now or drawings? Yeah. So yeah. then, yeah, so then what is the impetus behind writing a comic versus what is the impetus when you want to make a painting or a drawing? Well, it's more of a, I mean, I think all my my paintings have a certain amount of like there's a question to a story in it um it's just a comic is a more complete version of that so you really are telling the full story as opposed to just you know someone there's a doorway and and in the painting they're turning and looking around and and you know there's environmental color that you have going on or whatever it's like you know, oh i want to know what the story is behind that painting kind of mm -hmm. thing the comics it's more being deliberate about the same process. Okay. You know? And plus, and plus, I always like you know, uh, um, I did a talk at Art Center a few years ago, and it was the the title was really words and pictures, and I really like that too. You know, I like I like being able to throw the words together with the pictures and stuff, and 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 there is that there's the same feeling I get when I can do like that one stroke that really kind of bleeds, because I do mostly watercolor these days, mm. where it really has that nice bleed kind of edge that you get out of that stuff. And it's the same sort of feel when you write a really good line of dialogue. I see. Yeah. But for me, writing is harder than, than the art. Okay. Because it mostly it means like, because I, I can like, I can pick up a paintbrush and start start working with writing it's always about a little bit more about momentum like i have to make sure like i like i could work on let's say we're doing a new comic and it's like okay i know i have two hours this morning before i have to go and do something else kind mm -hmm. of thing i can do that and work writing a script it's more like oh i have to block out a couple days and then also with the writing of a script then there's also it's almost like baking a baking bread it's like you have to like okay I've, I've done my first vomiting out of the clay pass right mm -hmm. and then you have to at some point even if you're on a deadline go okay it's got to sit it's it, it's it's got to it's got to the the the, the 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 yeast has to rise mm -hmm. you know and then you come back at it because there's so many things especially in a script that you have to consider you know and 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 you can and especially too it's like i mean just this morning for 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 an adaptation I'm doing now, it's like it was middle of the night. I thought of a line that uh -huh. really made a character's arc fit, and it was just okay, you know. But that wasn't something I could have forced in a half hour. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, the way that you're describing writing <laughs> reminds me of when I draw, because. <laughs> And I mean, I, I, I guess I guess I wonder if it, I mean, it pro I'm, I'm sure it happens for, for other visual artists, um, you know, for other people who make fine art as well, because I mean, I, I, it takes me very, very long to finish a drawing. Uh, days, months, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm not able to draw every day of the week, but I am able to draw, you know, for like three, four days a week. Um, but even then it's like, it's very slow and considered and, you know, just, it, it's, for, I mean, for me, in, in a way, it's like every mark is a decision. It's like a, it's like a dis deliberate decision that then has to take part in the collection of marks that is the drawing. So, 
So, I mean, that makes a lot of sense as a comparison with writing, because, I mean, I don't write that much, and, and especially not screenplays or stories or not none, none of that stuff, but maybe, like, a, you know, a blog entry here and there. <laughs> it's not the same. It's not the same. I'm just saying that, you know, when I write something, like, I also want it to be cohesive and, like, this type of stuff, and, I mean, I, that makes a lot of sense, because sometimes you have, you definitely have to let it sit. And so, I mean, like, for example, when words are incorporated into something that is both visual and you know, written with words. I mean, I'm sure that you probably also have like an issue of selecting the right words, no? I mean, do you, are you choosy about words? For example, tell me what you think about the other thing as well, like the comparison. Um, oh no, I, I, I think you're right. Uh, but with words is more like, uh, it's, it's, I really don't have the problem with the words, the, cause really essentially if I get it done right, my characters will write themselves to a certain oh, degree. Interesting. Yes. Because uh, I'll, if I know them well enough, mm -hmm. it's almost, it's almost about taking the wind-up toys and putting them in the box and, yeah. and okay, now, now, because I, I know what the scene is and I know what needs to happen in the scene, uh -huh. and now I'm just going to put them in there and let them play. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the, to me, that's the key about writing dialogue specifically is that if you, as long as you know your characters and you know how they talk you know if like, oh, the character doesn't use contractions for some reason or that person mm -hmm, likes to mm -hmm. put a in their in their words or you know it's like that kind of stuff and that i think that brings it up to another level too the oh. same thing with, but the same thing with art it's like all of a sudden you get to a point where it's not you you've kind of gotten form down you know it's because i remember when i when i first started in comics uh uh you know, I'd go down to San Diego Comic Con with my portfolio in hand and get rejected like everybody else, sure. right? You know, and there was one year that a friend of mine who's no longer with us, Rod Underhill, had a uh, a he said, well, "I'm going to have a booth in the small press area. It's like you want to join me there, you know?" And I said, "Sure, why not?" And I had a a CRT uh, old school monitor that was about that big and about double the the the, the in, in the going back probably weighed about 150 pounds. Uh, I had a big inkjet print that I did that was 30 by 40, which were really hard to get back in 1993. Uh, <laughs> that uh, was a Green Lantern uh, that I penciled and, and inked and colored and had a 3D modeled power battery that I designed and 3D modeled wings coming out. And I had on the monitor, I had Spawn 3D animation come down, land and its cape going on the ground. Oh, that's cool. And, uh -huh. and everybody and their mother offered me work. Nice. And the year I couldn't get, the year before I couldn't get work for anybody, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you know, so so it's. It, but when I got hired, it's like the in was top cow, and they needed someone to start their computer coloring department. Mm -hmm. but besides lettering, the last thing that I'd wanted to, wanted to do in comics was be a colorist. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like no, I want a pencil and ink. I want to do that part of it. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, and and so when I got hired. I got down there, and like we were talking about earlier, I understood rendering. I understood form. I understood anatomy. Um, I did not understand color. I, 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 I could re render the heck out of things, but understanding bounce light, how warm and cool colors work together, how core shadows work versus re reflected light, the whole nine yards, and thank God for me, the guy who was also working, because it was it was Top Cow, Wildstorm, which is Jim Lee's company, Wills Portacio's company, all in one place. And it was it was the best place to ever join comics because it was an open floor plan. No one had closed offices. You had the best people in the industry all working there in the one place. And if you weren't a jerk, you could go around and learn from them as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Uh, but also, everyone was trying to beat everybody else. Right. So there was this level of competition. Healthy competition. But I, I, was, I was blessed to have Joe Chido there. And Joe Chido was the, he, he was a painter, artist, but he was also the guy back in the day where we did, there used to be computer guides. So hand done marker versions of the page that was then handed to the computer colorist for mm -hmm. them to basically du duplicate and do in Photoshop kind of thing. But Joe is where I learned so much from. You know, he, he was the one who was like, you know, I learned bounce light, I learned you know, all kinds of stuff. You'd go out to, to, to eat with Joe and he'd hold up a spoon and see how the convex reflection mm -hmm. is different than the concave reflection. Yeah. And, and yeah, if, 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 if I didn't have Joe, that, that he was, yeah. Okay. Um, 
I should ask you a little bit more about all of this comic stuff because I feel like I'm missing out on the information uh, regarding that whole thing because I learned recently that um, making covers is different from drawing the comic itself, from writing it, from, I mean, like you said, you know, coloring and inking and um, mm -hmm. uh, this type, I mean, I, I mean, can one person just write, can one person just make a whole comic? <laughs> yes, there are many of us. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there are there are many people that do all the things that I do in comics. That's for sure. Okay. So then. So then. Okay. So then, but would also you? Having said that, I usually will pull in help. Like you right. know, it's like I often will write with uh, David Hine, who uh, we've been doing stuff together for a while uh, before. And you know, but I also do things by myself. But it depends on the like we're we're developing a new thing right now, so we're bouncing all this stuff off. And I love working with David. Uh, I'll usually do have an assistant, you know, help out with the the, the pencils and inks, kind of thing, you know, spotting blacks and, and doing other things. Mm -hmm. And then Jared Van Dyke has been my strong right arm colorist for the last decade, and uh, he's a beautiful painter. He can paint oils. He can do everything. He's an amazing artist in his own right. And then I'll just take a pass over that. So you know, I kind of, you know, I'm not crazy enough to do it all 100% by myself. Okay. Yes. So then, all right. So then, writing the story that's going to take place in the comic mm -hmm. is different from like writing the dialogue, and that's different from making from drawing the panels. Well, uh, no, because I I work, I usually work full script, which means full script meaning that you're page one. This is what's happening on page one. Panel one. This characters ah! and then the next like, mm. what are you doing you know and, <laughs> and, and and panel two panel three you know all laid out like that way when what's happening in the panel and 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 then the script for the panel um and that's called full script uh the old old marvel method of doing uh comics and still some people do do it is called plot and it's basically you would tell the artist that this is basically what's happening okay and it's up to you to kind of break it down and then the writer comes in after the artwork is done and adds script. And I've tried that before and I felt, I mean, it's different when I work by myself because I'm just working with me, but if I'm working with another artist, I think full script is necessary because I don't think, I mean, there's just too much to the imagination and too much just right. can cross lines to, oh, I thought you meant that. No. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. That is yeah. so interesting. Right, so, so okay, so then the, the Marvel. The old school, I mean, when you look at the old school Jack Kirby and and Stanley, they did plot. You know, even on the Spawn issues that Todd McFarlane did with Greg Capullo when Greg was penciling it, he'd call Greg up, and he'd go, "Okay, and then this is what's going to happen in the issue." Da -da 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 -da, and Greg would record it, and then Todd would get the art, and Todd would throw in the dialogue and the captions and all the stuff at that point. Okay. You know, the description of that method, it sounds like a miracle that anything good even turned out of from that. Because yeah. it sounds it sounds like there's so much there's so much chaos thrown into the mix. Yeah. You know, like the method that you're talking about that you prefer sounds much more organized. And for example, if if you're writing a story or if you are kind of like the story director or something, meaning that you want the story to go in a specific way, yeah. um then that, it makes a lot more sense um, because I don't know if, if I was writing a story or I don't or I don't know I mean I'm just thinking of like when I make a drawing I'm like pretty punctilious about how I want the thing to look and I can't imagine leaving a ton of shit to like the writer and the artist or the dialogue or whomever like yeah I just I want this guy to trip over the curb and then he breaks his skull or something and then you do whatever you want and then some other guy is gonna figure out how to put some dialogue in there that that sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it only. It, I think it only really works if one, you're doing it for all yourself anyway, yeah. or two, that you have such a tight relationship creatively with that person you work with. Okay, yeah. You've worked with them for so long that you know what they're gonna do. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Okay, I suppose. But yeah, because I came from you know television production and all that stuff, that would be crazy to have like, okay, we're gonna go on set. You guys just kind of you know sit in the <laughs> coffee shop and you know it's like figure it out <laughs> yes yes i mean isn't that how curb your enthusiasm sort of went 
Well, I mean, kind of. Th- again, that but that's Larry's own show. Right. You know, Larry David. It's all his, so he can do ad lib half the time and have a general structure because he's actually there. Right. He's there. You yeah, know? yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. There's um. There's a couple of things that are. Uns- not not strictly unscripted, but kind of vaguely, roughly scripted that I, you know, are amusing, but I find stressful because they're not scripted, like Curb Your Enthusiasm and um, there was a funny one called Whose Line Is It Anyway? Yeah. And I was like, that that's so stressful for me. Because <laughs> it's like, I don't know. And anyway. Well, you know, it, it's <laughs> on the other flip side of that, it's fun for the performer, but, you know. I, 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 but I think it's one of those situations where you need to have a whole bunch of takes and then pick the ones that work, mm. you know? So you do that same, if you were ad-libbing the whole time, you're going to ad-lib a whole bunch, 15 ad-libs, and it's like, okay, we'll keep two, you know? The, the second one was a good one. Okay, that's what we'll keep, you know? Mm. But it just, it's, it seems to be, to me, it seems like a bit of a wasted effort because you just, it's not as controlled. Yeah, yeah, not as focused. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I should have asked this at the beginning, but how did you end up in comics anyway? It's like, um, why, why did you choose to do comics if you like art? When I, because um, I first had, uh, the, the first art I, 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 I really liked was science fiction, fantasy, that kind of stuff. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about, you know, uh, and I was always the kid in school that all the other kids had asked them to draw stuff for them and things <laughs> like that and everything. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until high school that uh, I had some friends who I met. There was like one of the very first, this is late 70s, uh, in the, uh, there was one of the very first gaming stores. D&D just started at that point and, and stuff. And I met some guys through that that we were playing games with and they're, they're like, there's these comics and they cherry picked all the best of the best right to show me and stuff and again the reason for comics and that because that was the only place because no one was really making you know big budget sci-fi movies or tv shows or anything so if you wanted to do fantasy superheroes and that kind of stuff that was the only medium to do it there was nothing else to do i mean you could do paperback book covers you know but that would be the only other thing to do Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I got hooked. They were showing me all the, the best, the best, all this cool Jim Starlin stuff, all this cool, you know, all these other, and then branching into like, you know, a, again, once you, once you get kind of beyond Marvel, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to start pulling in ma- manga stuff. You start pulling in all these kind of more, you know, like Luther Arkwright, you know, Brian Talbert stuff that's more edgy, all this kind of independent stuff, the, you know. Um, and, and, you know, I still also remember, though, that you could you could prove that you could do things that you didn't think were gonna be that great because there was like my friends who was uh kevin holguin brian holguin and kirk delbeck who were the guys who would give me the books and and i'd be like okay now what you got next what you got next you know and stuff and and it's like it's like well there's this one called daredevil it's like daredevil what's that it's like well he's this blind lawyer who fights (laughs) crime at night and i'm like that can't be any good and he handed me the first frank miller daredevils when he was doing that, and then it was just like, okay, it just proved <laughs> that you could do it, you know. Yeah. It, 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 again, by experimenting with the, by by seeing the manga stuff, seeing the stuff, especially back then, and everything, Akira for the first time back in the day, it's like, you can do anything in this mm. medium, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know? Because I think you, because I think at a certain point you do, most comic artists who've done the superhero stuff, you kind of eventually sort of graduate from that i hate to say i mean i know that's not really probably the best term but you want to move into something that's more you know it's got more teeth more maybe realism maybe more other subjects that you can't really do with a superhero kind of thing and Mm -hmm. stuff like that but yeah so so that's so i had my first job offer to pencil at marvel when i was 18 and but it was really and then again no fedex at this time no internet at this time you had to move to manhattan and i right. grew up in southern california and it was pretty much to be part of the bullpen to start which was like you know 35 dollars a page and they don't guarantee you work and you had to move to new york basically go to there to starve it's a big uh, gamble and, yeah yeah and i uh, okay i'm gonna 
go to film school instead. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I went to film school instead, started working in television, but decided I didn't want to be a television executive. And would then, okay, let's, and I was, the whole time I've been, I was doing, uh, developing all these new computer techniques uh, for making comics and stuff on the Amiga and, and then the IBMs after that and stuff. There's a, most of the, most of the, the, the uh, production techniques that are used in modern comics are from me. The mm. new, the way color separations are done, you know, all that kind of stuff is from the work I did with myself and John and Clyde me back in those old Wildstorm days. Um, but, um, so I was always really cutting edge with that stuff and I was always working with that and I just decided that I didn't want to be a television executive and then I'd go down, like I said, to San Diego with my portfolio and get rejected and get rid of it. And then finally in 1993, Mark Silvestri said, come on down. And he matched the salary that both my wife and I were working at Warner Brothers. And it was like matched our salaries and we moved down to San Diego and started there. Okay. And would you, I mean, do you know, do you know what it's like to try to get into comics now versus what it was like, you know, when you were trying to do it? Would you say it's harder now? It's harder now because the, well, it's harder now because the pool of competition is, is wider. It's right. worldwide now. Right. So it's not, I, I really, when I was an illustrator before I was in comics, you know, I pretty much just had to deal with... <clears throat> mostly other artists that were in California. Right. With, you know, um, which was enough problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 it's funny because the, the, way, the way I got into illustration more often than being that good, especially when I started, was I was just more dependable. It's like I saw so many, so many guys lost jobs because they didn't complete the job, they were late, and I was always kind of, Hey, I'm here. Oh, yeah, I yeah. Can do it. You know, it's like I'm here. <laughs> that really worked out really well. And I and that's I think that's again going into comics and people wanting to break into comics. That's also an incredibly important thing. Because a lot of times there are guys who have major careers that the only reason they have that career is the person who had the job and head of them screwed up, mm. and they were there to take it over. That's 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 Charlie Adler from The Walking Dead. You know, Charlie was always the most dependable guy in the world and you'd have somebody who just dropped the ball on something from marvel and he'd get the calls like can you do 10 pages by tomorrow and charlie's like okay they weren't the best 10 pages in the world but he got the job done and got you know the thing and and that's i think that's hugely important for any yeah, yeah. but yeah it, it's hard it's right now it's about uh, you got to build the social media presence Mm. you know uh and uh because because the, the the companies do look around instagram and, and and places and stuff um and then also just knowing knowing who's out there and who you want to get work from uh you know go to the comic book store pull out those books that i mean don't pull out a book that's like Oh, this looks like nothing. What I want, like nothing I want to do, and and not the style or whatever. That editor is probably not an editor that you want to hit up with your work. Mm -hmm. You know, find something that's like, even if you're not ready yet, find that editor that oh that guy does. He works on the books that I really like, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and just target it and just you know send them because there's also you know you can still send packages to these places you right. know um, and it's just about consistency at that point and just you know when you're ready. I mean. Uh, but Todd McFarlane had like I want to say like over a hundred rejection letters, you know, and you can't let it get you down right. too. You have to speak out. You know, I'm just I'm gonna keep going, keep going. It's funny. I also kind of counsel a lot of young artists that for their day job not to have a day job that's also actually art related, especially art related in a job that they don't want to do. Like I say, it's an advertising job that mm. they don't really don't want to do that. They want to do you know comics and and whatever else. Because if you have a job like I had in television, when I went home, I was all set to sit at my computer or drawing board and be drawing because right. that's right. not what I was doing all day. Yeah, yeah. You know, that makes a lot of sense. It's important to have a job so you can make a living and, and not starve. Um, but uh, I, I often tell young artists don't get a job, you know, being a cog in somebody else's art wheel unless. 
unless there's a point for that unless you're like you know working under somebody that you want to learn from and right. and and that kind of stuff but yeah it's harder you got to you got to build a social media presence uh because that really means something to them if you, if you if someone has like you know twenty five thousand followers they'll pay more attention even if the artwork was exactly the same from two different artists and this person had you know 50 followers and this person has twenty five thousand followers they're in business to sell books and right. they know this is going to help get more word out about that title than that sure you know but that takes time yeah it takes consistency it takes a lot of effort you know yeah and i guess i guess the social the social media aspect wasn't there before no right yeah so then that's another like an added thing that a person if a person is interested in that that they have to work on right yeah when i when i started it was you know uh pages would get sent around fedex because people couldn't afford scanners either when 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 i was i mean the whole nine yards there were there was barely internet to send the scan through anyway <laughs> yeah and, and 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 yeah and 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 people didn't know how to properly save the stuff so it was optimized so it wasn't a gigantic file and all these kind of things they didn't know how to do but it was also the technology was really expensive it was like mm. to color a the, when I first started in 93, to have a co computer that could actually color a comic book page, an 11 by 17 color page, required a Mac. I was a PC guy and I was determined, oh, the PC's gonna do it, the PC's <laughs> gonna work. I'm gonna bring down my PC to the studio, it's gonna work. Yeah. And I had the fastest consumer-based computer uh, PC you could get. It was a D486 DX50, you know, and, and it just choked because the old operating system on the PC at that time was a 16-bit operating system. So it just couldn't handle the amount of data. We had to, uh, you know, I went to Mark Silvestri and said, Mark, I need, you know, we need to get a Mac, you know, and stuff. And it's like, we got the top of the line Mac, which was like, Quadra 840 AV, you know, <laughs> $10,000. Right. You know, that big scanner, the scanners were basically the small size of a small car and the scanners alone would cost $5,000. That's you know, crazy. So in the beginning, there weren't a lot of independent people able to do it by themselves. They had to join studios and stuff like that because they couldn't cough up $15,000 to- Right, for the equipment this. alone. Yeah, because I mean, when I, when I left Top Cow and started my coloring studio, um, my, first, my first client was Todd McFarlane, which enabled me to get all the, all the rest of the stuff working out. But we had, I remember, uh, the biggest printer in North America was Quebec Corps at the time, and they were they're in Canada, or, and they don't think they exist anymore, that's another thing. But uh, Todd's Uncle Kenny, because we, we used to have to do film output too. So we had film, and then going to getting plates burned, and then going to the printer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and Todd's Uncle Kenny, who had the film output place, they were his, his what was convenient about that was his place was right next to Quebec Corps, so they could literally go out the door and walk files or walk film directly into Quebec Corps, which helps on deadlines, of course. And then I remember Todd paying for the fastest possible internet connection that I could possibly have in 1995, which was an ISDN line, which is basically two 288 baud modems round together, so <laughs> you got. 52, uh, you know, or 56 out of, out of, out of, the, out of the, the thing, and it's that whole, you know, bang, 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 <laughs> okay, connecting, da, 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 and you're like, you know, even with that, you're just like seeing the progress of a page, inch, 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 mm -hmm, inch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. No, it used to, call, it used to take, back in the day, 93, when we had to, because we use, because I, I, I printed an RGB workflow, but when we would have to trap and CMYK a page, it would take 24 hours to trap and CMYK 22 pages of a comic. That's how Jeez. long it took Photoshop to do it. That's crazy. And you had <laughs> so to do long. it. Yeah, yeah, no choice. So you're like, you know, you think, oh, I got the deadline done. It's like, no, you got another 24 hours of sitting and hoping nothing crashes. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, the crashing. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you for indulging my questions about your comics, your sure. career in comics. Um, okay. I must ask you other things, Mr. Haberlin. What is art in your opinion? Mm -hmm. 
it's more like what I like. Uh, so it's 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 something that moves me. It's mm -hmm. something that, but it, but it it doesn't have to. It, it can mean all kinds of things to me. So it's it can be something that just oh, that's beautiful, you know, or oh that initiates this kind of a response, you know, or it makes me want to do something. Because it's all about communications at the end of the day too, mm -hmm. you know. But I definitely, um, yeah, it's it's. To me, it, it, it's, I guess I, it's, it's about finding beauty to a certain degree. Uh-huh. Okay. And that can be all kinds of stuff. I mean, it doesn't mean that my vision of beauty is your vision of beauty, you know? Right. Yeah. No. Um, it could be just like seeing that, you know, a painting that's just, you know, clouds and, and a few birds and if it's cropped the right way and lit the right way and painted the right way then it's like okay that's awesome well, that sounds good to, that looks good to me you know it's like i mean I, I love looking at like uh you know it's like oh especially too when i'm i'm you know pulling out like books like this mm -hmm. where you can then go through and see you know all these classic illustrators you know see all these styles that people had you know because i think that's that's the and, and I don't think I'm there yet either. Um, I am kind of that way with my comics, but not with my fine art yet. Where it's like, you can look at one of my fine art pieces and go, "Oh, that's really pretty. That's really nice." But uh -huh. it doesn't go, "Oh, that's Haberlin." You know what I mean? It's like uh -huh. you know, it's like I. I so there's there, there's that level of once you get your skills to a certain point where you kind of execute anything you want to be able to execute, which mm -hmm. is wonderful and great. Mm -hmm. But then the next level above that is finding that voice that is so unique to you okay that someone can just take a glimpse of the work and go oh that's Gabriella's you know I see you know okay so so the level that you think you've yet to reach is um, for your fine art work to be recognizable as like a hab like a Haberlin like you know your own yeah. style yeah interesting and people say they, they they think I have that I don't think I do yet Okay. Why don't you think you do yet? What do you think is missing? More stylization. Mm -hmm. More stylization. Like, I mean, again, if you look at, like, like let's say, for example, um, like, uh, you know, again, I could point to almost anybody who has, like, that really definitive style, but let's take uh, J.C. Leindecker, you know, uh, it's like the eyes are done a certain way, mm -hmm. you know? the hair is done a certain way you know so it's okay. not so you can so like every it's like it's a bit methodical i think mm -hmm. at the end of the day when you're we're really kind of crafting what that style is because mm -hmm. ideally if it's done right every aspect of it is yours like no one does a sky like that mm -hmm. like no one does hair like that mm -hmm. you know no one does you know all that kind of stuff you know whatever and uh, and really, I, I again, I, I think you know, looking back, you know, I don't think anyone creates anything new without looking to the past. Oh, of and course. And just going through, you know, all these things and kind of like, you know, to a certain degree, there can be a little bit of Frankensteining of like, you know, this and that together, and and you know, making something new out of out of that kind of stuff, you know. Right. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know that's that stylistic development. I I often it, it often if not always makes me think of handwriting, um, because you know p people who draw comics or people who do fine art, for example, like figurative fine art. Everyone is drawing or painting the figure, but when they get to the point that you're talking about, you know the figures are all going to look different from one artist that have developed to that point to the other, to the next. And um, I just think that's interesting, and it's an interesting contrast of the subject matter being the same, meaning the figure, but then there's all of this individuation between all of the people participating in making, in depicting the, sub, the same subject matter. Yeah. You know? Um, okay. Um, why, why do you think... 
getting to that point is important? And, and, and why do you think getting to that point is important? And do you think you're there in terms of your comics? Uh, yeah, I think I'm pretty much there when it comes to my comics. But I still, I'm always experimenting. You know, I've pushed the format in all kinds of different ways, uh, successfully and unsuccessfully. Um, and I'm always uh, an experimenter. You know, it's like like I was just I, I was going to do a couple of vids on uh, on some of my processes. Like if you saw sometimes at the very end of of did we have one around here in this room, um, you know, at the very end I'll pull back some some whites on my watercolors by scraping. And what I mm. use to scrape is I have these dental tools that allow for very very precise. Uh, lifting and scraping of the stuff and I was going to do it. And, and your dentist, to, a tip for everybody, if you go to the dentist and you get cleanings and stuff and, and you're nice to them, they recycle all those things. So usually they just are, are throwing the recycling. If you say, hey, do you have something you want to get rid of? They'll get, and they're great for sculpting because I sculpt too. <laughs> okay. so it's like, you know, they're great for sculpting and detailing. But the other thing that I started playing with, because I didn't like, so I just had that gallery show and I didn't like Traditional watercolors, when they're when they're when they're framed, you know, you got a mat, you got the glass frame, and in the show, um, there were other some oils, some people with oils next to me, and you know, they're not that, they're not they're not matted. There's not a matted mat. And to me, the mat, like, and, and this is not to poo poo anybody. To me, it felt like it felt very student ish yeah. to me, you know, um, and so I was like trying to figure out a good way to to because my my watercolors tend to look more oily anyway mm. you know they have that kind of more vigorous strokes and, and and things in them and so i i was looking around for different mediums to maybe do the surface on and i found there was uh people started using dorland's wax medium so you take it so the watercolor is done you take it and it's like it's wax it's big like whitey matte cleary matte laughing you wipe it onto the stuff mm -hmm. and people in their tutorials were like oh here you wait 24 hours and then you buff it and, and you can get a little bit of a shine or more shine and stuff and I and I thought like well it's wax let me let me try something else with it and it's like so I would put it on let it dry for the 24 hours and if you take a hot air dryer depending on how much how hot you leave it on the thing is how glossy or unglossy the surface uh, yeah of course yeah and it becomes very like a varnish it looks like a beautiful varnish and you could pour now water on top of that watercolor and it just beads right off so nice. it's totally protected yeah and yeah. you can now frame them like oils nice yeah. but that's but that's where my head my head always goes it's like well why do people do that that way yeah. maybe i could try it this way uh -huh. <laughs> okay um do so you I also have you know i have the i have uh, Digital Art Tutorials is one of my sites where okay. I used to do tons of tutorials on digital art and stuff like that. I've been remiss for years because I've been too busy drawing my own stories and stuff. But uh, you know, but I've taught a lot of people, uh, especially on the digital side for sure. And I have traditional art tutorials, but I just haven't had a chance to do any new ones. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you something just now. Oh, do you post watercolors on your Instagram? Yes. Okay. Um, you made me very curious about them. Yeah. No, okay. Ninety-nine percent of my Instagram is my fine art. My, well, I do more comic stuff on my Facebook because that's where that group um, seems okay. to be. But on my Instagram, Brian Haberlin official, it's ninety-nine percent my watercolors. I just posted one this morning. Wow, it's so saturated. Oh, thanks. You want to hear another tip? Uh, another tip for that? Sure. Two more, two more tricks. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, so I work uh, on arches, paper, or oil paint, mm -hmm. not for watercolor. And what that enables me to do is the watercolor sits up on top of the surface more than it does on standard watercolor paper. So I you see. can move it around more like oils. Interesting. And then the other bit to get those saturated colors is 
I've been an archival printmaker for decades, and so I'll put uh, archival inkjet ink in with my watercolors to bump up the saturation. Yeah. And it's actually more archival than the watercolors I'm putting the, the drops into because it's got a 200 year lifespan uh, for it, but enables you to get that real, you know, color to it. Yes, how interesting. Um, uh, well, so as I was saying earlier, I draw, I don't paint. Um, but I find very interesting to hear people talking about this whole chemistry thing, you know, not just, not just the chemistry of the oil colors and whatever, but like also the relationship between the colors and like, oh my God, the warms and the cold. And it's like, I mean, like you, like, I don't really know about that stuff. And I can't say that I care because I, I like drawing just like with one pencil, <laughs> you know, but, uh, this, you know, like that and like this, these, uh, uh, tricks that you're talking about for making your watercolors. That's really cool. Uh, and yeah, they look they look lovely. Oh, thank you. Uh, what were you gonna say, sorry? No, no, I wasn't going anywhere. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, all right, I'll uh, have a look afterwards because I don't wanna be looking down <laughs> on the recording the whole time. Uh, Mr. Haberlin, what is art in your opinion? Art's what makes me happy. <laughs> so, sorry, I asked the question twice. Yeah. Sorry about that. What's beauty in your opinion? <laughs> sorry. What did you say? What, what's beauty? What is beauty? Yes. I don't have any limits on that. Uh, uh, you know, I can see. Uh, you know, I yeah, I don't have any limits for that. I mean, because it could be, I could see something that's 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 what most people would call grotesque. That. Mm -hmm depending on, oh, look at the way the light's hitting that ooze. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, it's cool, you know? but, I mean, I, that's why I, I love, you know, going out and hiking and things like that for, for, for inspiration, because you, you just look around, you'll just notice things that, you know, that, oh, look how that's reflecting on, oh, look how the dead leaf is, 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 is affecting the surface of the water as it's going down and how the lights hitting this that and the other thing around it um uh yeah i, I yeah i think again again the beauty thing is 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 totally subjective you know mm -hmm. and because i appreciate yeah, there's all kinds of things i'll appreciate it's like i'll appreciate you know crazy, you know, perspective someone's using in something, you know, or, or, you know, um, just all kinds of stuff. I mean, if I look down like my friends in Instagram, their, their styles range all over the place, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, so yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I mean, <laughs> no, no, I mean, not a problem. Um, Beauty but... is red. No, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I guess I wonder if, I, I guess I wonder, because I mean, I, I agree with you in the sense that I, of course, I often feel similarly about lots of things. Like I, um, more than once, and I don't really know why, walking out here in uh, where I live in Brooklyn, I've run into like slaughtered pigeons that sometimes I just find like a wing, <laughs> like on the, yeah. on the sidewalk. Um, or two wings one time, for example, and I'm very curious about what happened, but at the same time, it's like that, that, uh, end result of whatever happened is like, you know, I stop and look at it and kind of like appreciate it. And sometimes the, like the time that I found two wings, they were arranged in a really, a way that I enjoyed, even though yeah. it was gruesome, obviously. Sure. Um, so I guess, I mean, I think... That's applicable. I feel like that's actually applicable to most people because I have just heard it. I feel like I've heard it so often, not just in conversation, but in the podcast. I mean, I don't have that many episodes, but I have almost a hundred. Um, but anyway, I just feel like it's it seems to be a common experience in people, in you know, individuals. And I wonder if it's really something about the way something looks versus a series of things happening to converge in a specific moment like like well, you like because for example like when you're out hiking you know you're yeah. you're set up 
to spend time with nature and you're gonna run into like a dead squirrel or something so i'm just saying that like kind of like the mindset in the moment it is, is a specific one because it's like it's like okay so the slime might look nice sometimes but if you see a snotty little kid that's crying you're not gonna enjoy his snotty nose you know what i'm saying so it's like so it's like the slime is nice sometimes but it's not always nice so then i just think that it's not about the appearance of the thing does does that make sense what do you think about that it's also but i think what also in your your uh your example uh it was also about the uniqueness the uniqueness of those two wings being the way they were mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh because maybe that kid with the snotty nose if he's also also eating this green you know candy the whatever and you see it dripping down part of the candy it's like oh that could kind of look cool you know <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know so it's about also i think i think i think that's probably more if i had to put my finger on anything uh uniqueness is what i okay. like in beauty because that because that also then that that explains why you know we like people you know appearances who was like you can have you know someone who's like you know it's like because I'll, I'll often tell people it's like you know i think tilda Sw swindon is beautiful you mm -hmm. know and you'll have all these people like what do you mean she's ugly what are you talking about it's like no she you know it's, it's really unique you know she, you know or, or or whatever it's like really appreciating the you know and, and again that gets into the stylization too like i was talking about so you have you know uh you know uh, a bunch of classic painters that were different stylizations of different things or even rodin you know sculpting mm -hmm. those figures that's that that's his style you know that's mm -hmm. that, that big strong jawline it's like there's a there's one sculptor and i always forget his name he has a bunch of stuff in the um oh, the big church in london uh the cathedral there and they are almost like do you do you know thunderbird puppets do you know no. the marionation kind of anyway uh just like kind of stylized where they have a, i mean like just the really kind of really stylized jaws those full lips with the extra curves that you would get and really and it's just a little bit bigger than normal eyes and stuff and it all just works together mm -hmm. really really well you know mm -hmm. um i'm a huge fan too of like you know old uh poster stuff and you know, old french posters old italian posters all that but even like some of the old propaganda posters from like you know the old like you know soviet union propaganda posters where you had those like you know meaty figures with the you know all that kind of stuff and everything and it's just like the stylization it's oh that's unique you know mm -hmm. that's different it's unique i like that it's not plain vanilla you know everything looking the same you know mm -hmm. I, I mean that would, i think that would be the the one pro that's why i i would always think that i i need to have like a couple artists pseudonyms for me so it's like because i would get i think if i did finally get oh that's that style you know let's mm -hmm. let's say you know you know whatever that that that, that style it's like at a certain point i'd want to be able to not have to do that style right you know yeah but your fans that you've built up now want to see that style. Sure. And that was that was that was actually a, a it was interesting because I saw that happening in real time when I first joined comics with um, with uh, Jim Lee, his company w was there, and you know Jim was top of the pyramid still pretty much is when it comes to comic art, um, but he was trying to do these different styles. And yeah. And the response was not good <laughs> and you know and he was kind of lost and then he eventually just embraced the skid and went back to his traditional Jim Lee style and everybody loved it and yeah huge career <laughs> you're back but I know but I know for a fact he wanted to break out of it and he couldn't mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well you know the unique thing that you're talking about reminds me of the definition of art of a previous guest, it was a uh, Kurt Cowper. I don't remember the episode number, but he's a, he was a, a teacher. He's a teacher at the school that I went to, which is the New York Academy of Art. And he said that art is something that makes the familiar unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. And yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, 
it's not the same as something being unique necessarily, but it's more something being depicted or presented or like, you know, showing up to you when you're in a hike or when I'm walking out in the street in a way that you hadn't seen it before. Because, yeah. I mean, of course, I mean, I have a, um, we have a patio here. I mean, we don't have access to the patio, but there's like moving families of pigeons there. I mean, I see pigeons all the fucking time. Right. So like I've seen their wings, but then it's like when you all, when I only see the wings like all, spl uh, you know, splayed and splattered like that, it's like that's that's weird, you know. And so that kind of demands my attention in a way versus something that I've seen very many times, even though it's basically but arguably the same thing, you know. So I think it might be, you know, that might be the reason why even sometimes a snotty child that's crying, his little mucus coming out of his nose might seem like amusing or funny, you know, because if it's yeah. mixed in with candy color, yeah. it might, yeah. okay. Or you even know how sometimes the snot will actually make a bubble. Yeah, so yeah. Bubble. Yeah. Yes, yes. It happens very often in the winter. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, Mr. Haberlin, we have broken the 55 minute mark of our conversation today. Um, so is there, uh, I'm gonna start to close it out. Is there anything you wanna add um, what projects do you have coming up? Um, do you have any uh, fine art shows coming up? Um, more comics? Where can people find your work? There, there's uh, the LA Art Show, which happens at the Convention Center in February. I, I'll be uh, uh, exhibiting with the Arcadia Gallery there. Um, and then there's a group show uh, in uh, San Francisco in November next year. Um, and, uh, and, and then for comics, um, it depends which come up first. It's like, I'm working on, I did my, my first two big graphic novels, Anomaly, uh, oh, Anomaly. So that, this was a big giant landscape, fully painted graphic novel. This nice. is one, did two, and we're going to be starting on three. Um, but we're also going to be working on a brand new, uh, a brand new series with David Hind um, that will be sort of like a television series. Is, no, this will be a comic series for that, uh, and that will be uh, basically imagine a future thing where where now we have such high, hyper accurate maps of of the of the universe and smart enough quantum computer that astrology actually works. <laughs> okay. So imagine a hundred years after that started, what a caste system is like based on your sign. Yes, yes, of course. Um, so that that that's, that's that sounds one. really interesting. Yeah. And Wait, and, and, and what is that story called? What is that one going to be called? Right now, it's called Magus, but it may change. Okay, that sounds like a really cool story. I should have asked you, like, all right, so then how do you think of the stories? <laughs> <laughs> They, you know, I, I always tell people it's, it's partially because I'm, I think, a, a attention deficit syndrome, and I'll just like, you know, if I'll mishear something, it's like, oh, I know that's not what they intended, but that's cooler than what they intended. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, because, yeah, because, all right. Yeah, that sounds like a really, because, I mean, the thing about the astrology, astrology sounds like a really interesting and fun premise. Uh, well, I for think a story. Too, it's, it's one of those things that whether people believe in astrology or not, I think everybody on the planet knows their sign. Oh, for so sure. Somehow, in so in somehow, several different cultures too. Yeah, and so somehow they can they can relate to this story. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we're getting mm -hmm. on that. We're getting on a bunch of entertainment stuff. We have uh, my Hellcop uh, thing. We have. T uh, we have all the de development stuff set for that. We have the guy who wrote uh, the first two X-Men movies and the Watchmen movie and ran uh, Warrior Nun on television attached to be our showrunner, executive producer on that. And we'll be taking it. I mean, everything got, we were so set up for a whole bunch of shows to go out and then the strikes happened, uh -huh. you know? And now the strikes are over. The way Hollywood kind of works, Hollywood basically kind of shuts down November, December. So you're not out there pitching stuff. I have my Sonata property with Ridley Scott, and that'll be going out uh, in January. So I have a bunch of stuff that I'm also, you know, kind of producing, executive producing, co-writing for entertainment stuff as well, too. 
Damn, that's ranked. All right. Cool. <laughs> if it, you know, it, but it, I've been around the block so many times. It's like, you know, I, I, it's like the only thing I ever got made was the Witchblade TV show. You know, I've sold plenty of pilots and this kind of the other thing. But until something gets made and it's on, you know, there's there's 50 things that can go wrong. Of course, yes. Yes. You know, including just the executive at the company being fired and there's a new one. And since they didn't bring your thing on board, it's like, yeah, I'm not interested in that. I think there's a whole Seinfeld plot about that very same thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, it, it reminds me a little bit of what you were saying of uh, applying to a bunch of things and just getting a bunch of rejections that it's like... It, it, it's like the same with all the steps along the process. Yeah. It's like they could all just get rejected and it just never happens. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, okay. Uh, well, Mr. Haberlin, I have greatly enjoyed this conversation. Um, thank you very much. You. Yeah. Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for t all the stories and uh, your sincerity and the answers. Uh, thank you to everyone who has... Uh, listen to this conversation, will listen to this conversation. Remember to like and share this video and subscribe to my audiovisual channel. Please uh, take note of the, all the links that will be in the show notes because that's how you can support uh, the podcast, my work, and uh, Brian's work, which is uh, considerable, and I think you should support his work because it sounds awesome. Um, and so thank you everyone for watching and listening, and uh, have a fantastic day. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.